fantastic that you can be with us here tonight. Uh, my name's Louise Denoon, and I'm um, the executive manager of Queensland Memory here at the State Library. And it's just my role at the beginning to briefly introduce tonight's event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Turrbal people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. The location of State Library on Kurilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people, and we proudly continue that tradition here today. I'd also like to introduce our very distinguished um, panel and really acknowledge and welcome them. Professor Karen Hageman, James G. Keenan, Distinguished Professor of History, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And if we've got time, please ask about the title um, of her role. Uh, Professor Nita Crawford, Boston University. Associate Professor Fiona Paisley from Griffith University. Associate Professor Victoria Haskins from the University of Newcastle. And Kate Evans, uh, Dr. Kate Evans from Radio National, and fantastic. Uh, we've worked with Kate on various projects, and it's wonderful to have her back in Brisbane. We're pleased uh, to present tonight's talk as part of Griffith University's Centre for Cultural Research in partnership with the Australian Women's History Network. And I suppose just to set the scene, because it is fantastic that this is taking place at the State Library, um, that we do hold here, like other state libraries, national libraries, um, lots of material that relates to, um, uh, to conflict and to war in the 20th century, and particularly to World War I. Um, I think that, that in many ways, particularly with World War I, these collections have been sitting here for 80 to 100 years waiting for people to discover and unpack them and unpick them. There's just uh, so much to be revealed about what happened uh, during that time. And those of you have so noticed, some of you here tonight, have been involved in the State Library's project, Q Anzac 100, Memories for a New Generation, where we are committed to digitising, to encouraging scholarship, interpretation, um, and storytelling around World War I, the 100th anniversary, and very much within the context of SLQ, trying to do it within the broadest possible story, that it's, as the, it's as the home front, it's the anti-conscription, it's the pacifist, the conscientious objectors, the um, Indigenous experience. How do we use this four years to really unpack that? And just to whet your appetite, rather than going you through, taking you through all of our wonder treasures, um, is the papers that we have here of Margaret Thorpe. She was a Quaker feminist and pacifist who campaigned in Queensland against the war during World War I at great cost to herself. She was harassed by the police and government officials and assaulted and abused at rallies. Um, a particularly famous incident, or notable, infamous, um, in July 1917. So I think these, these things are here, and it behoves us to be interested in them and to, uh, and to unpick them. Uh, we do have a, a, a large collection from the Society of Friends, and I see some uh, people from the organisation here today. So I suppose, how do we uh, you know, dig deep? How do we have new ways of wait to interpret and discover that material? So tonight, we're privileged to be able to hear from uh, leading women um, in the field, all here for the AHA conference taking place at UQ, and how wonderful that we have a public event where we can um, share the ideas and continue the discussion in this forum. Um, Tonight, so please turn off your mobile phones if people have got them on. We are recording this event, and Kate will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and, oh, for those of you, and I may be the only one in the room, but if you do want to tweet, we just invented the hashtag anti-war, um, hashtag anti-war. But, um, yeah, so please, over to Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Well, hello and welcome to Rethinking the 20th Century as the Anti-War Century on Big Ideas on Radio National and at the State Library of Queensland, where we're also part of the Australian Women's History Network. 
I'm Kate Evans, and in this year that has been defined over and over again in terms of the war that began a century ago, we're here to ask, what happens if you reframe that century? What stories, passions, heroics, arguments, fractures, individuals and movements were anti-war? And to explore those questions, we're joined today by a specialist in gender and memory, especially in relation to Germany, Professor Karen Hagemann, a political theorist, theorist who's looked very closely at the costs of war and how we understand moral responsibility, and that's Professor Nita Crawford, a historian of the Indigenous experience in Australia with an interest in particular in women and war, Associate Professor Victoria Haskins, and another who has worked on cultural internationalism and race, and that's Professor Fiona Paisley. Welcome to all of you. But Fiona, can I begin with you? You initiated this forum, and in a year marking the beginning of commemoration and celebrations of the First World War, that was no accident. So why? Why is it important to give anti-war itself a history? Thanks, Kate. Uh, well, I guess the first thing to say is the panel wasn't conceived as a sort of an, in opposition to conservative military histories. What um, we're interested in tonight is thinking about new kinds of war histories of the sort we've been, become used to in the last couple of decades, histories informed by gender, memory, civilian experience and so on. If we think in the Australian context, a uh, collection that came out in 1995 called Gender and War, edited by Joy de Musi and Marilyn Lake. So it has been a number of decades now uh, where we have these kinds of a very much living war histories, if you like. And I'm interested in how they relate to anti-war histories um, and thinking more about that connection. So if you can't, you can't really have one without the other. Um, in some war histories, that's implicitly recognised, um, but um, rarely is it really the connection explicitly made. So what anti-war histories mean and their relationship to war history, I guess, will depend on for each person in the panel and a, a kind of different connection. But in general terms, you might think of um, absolute pacifists on one end, sort of peace activists, and then the alternative stories of the experience of war and anti-war that make us think again about that history, about the 20th century. So given that, Fiona, in terms of your own work specifically, what brought, this, brought you to this, or what sparked that work for you? Well, I've been looking at the histories of social justice and humanitarianism in the first half of the 20th century, mainly looking through international networks. So I've been very interested in how Australians saw themselves as internationalists and worked uh, from outside Australia but also within Australia on a number of different uh, reform projects and campaigns in which peace and cooperation were an essential component. And the more I did that work, the more I realised that there were so many networks, so many non-government organisations, so many individuals, so many people, and this proliferation of engagement with what war and what anti-war means um, just seemed to me to um, remind us very much that history is very contested. Um, our own time, history is contested. It's been contested in the past. So thinking through the present into those past moments and contexts with individuals, particularly in my case, looking at networks and organisations. So Karen Hagemann, as a specialist in German and, and European history, how important is that question to you, what anti-war means and how it's remembered? How important is that for you in the context of that other centenary? I must say that I cannot imagine a 20th century European history without thinking about war. And for me, uh, the starting point really to try to uh, use a gender approach in respect of the history of war was the 1990s, the war in former Yugoslavia, which reminded us that war is not something which is gone for Europe. It was really close to us. And so, um, my own approach is not so much looking on the history of peace movements, even so I did this, but I really try to use the critical methodology of gender history and cultural history to deconstruct the master narratives, the heroic master narratives, the nationalist master narratives of war. And of course, as the German, this is really what we have to do because we caused more or less two 
world wars. And so uh, my generation really started in the 70s and 80s to critically rethink this history and rewrite this history. And I really believe we need to understand what causes war, what really motivates people, enables people to fight, what really costs war have, which long-term and short-term uh, aftermaths the different wars have. And only if we understand this, we can also really hope, I'm not naive, but still I hope that with our work we can really help to prevent war. And if we think about post-1945 Europe, in some ways, yes, with the exception of former Yugoslavia, uh, there is a lot of criticism of Europe, but I see it a little bit differently. I think it's amazing if you think about the last 200 years, how many wars were started in Europe, you know, or by Europeans, how relatively peaceful, at least in Europe, the situation is, and how nations who fought several wars against each other now get along and the young people communicate. So that is my approach to this kind of subject. Is there a personal story though as well that as to how you got into this area or this way of looking at war and anti-war? Yes, actually there's a very personal story. You might have heard this that I'm quite passionate about this. I'm coming from a social democratic family and so the fight against war is really in the history of my family. My grand grandfather fought during the first war as an independent social democrat against the uh, support of the majority social democratic party of the war. He f they were part of the peace movement, social democratic peace movement in the interwar period. He was in concentration camps and after wars, and I told you the story, I'm actually already as a small child, I was in a prem participating in peace demonstrations. And so um, for me, there is a very powerful personal tradition of peace activism, which I combine with my own academic work, or try to combine. And Nita Crawford, you work on the ethics and moral responsibilities of wars and international events. This is as contemporary and political as it is historical though, isn't it? Yes, everything we do is, um, I, I would argue, ethical, but in, in cases of um, war, the, of course the passions come to the surface and then we have arguments where you try to silence people. Um, so one of the things that I've uh, been looking at is how there are always anti-war movements. The question is whether or not we know about them. And it's because uh, the, of the silencing, this sort of uh, super patriotism that happens. Um, so that, yes, everything is an ethical argument and the activists um, bring that to the fore. And how did you come to this? What, what drives you? Are they political questions or intellectual ones or are you approaching this as an activist? I mean, how do you come to these big mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, well, I've been doing this work for more than 30 uh, something years, 35 years, and um, I started as an activist, as an anti-nuclear activist, um, and then I, uh, and as an undergraduate, I studied something called, uh, I made my own concentration, the war system and alternatives to militarism, and then um, did more work at MIT in the bombs and rockets program, is what we called it, where we learned uh, many of my uh, colleagues at, in the PhD program went on to work in the Department of Defense and f for the Brookings Institution, RAND, and so on. Um, and I could have gone there, but I, I went the sort of more nerdy route and uh, been writing about war since then. For me, the, the passion is um, trying to understand the causes of war and then how to prevent war, but always um, going back and forth to, to helping, uh, if I can, people who are not specialists understand what's going on. And Victoria Haskins, how does anti-war, or the idea of what anti-war might be, how does that come into your work? I and mean, what does that phrase mean to you? Well, my, um, this work that I'm doing now is sort of uh, something of a departure from my previous work, which has been on relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous women. Uh, but I've come to, be really interested in looking at the impact of war on women um, in Australia, and particularly World War I. Anti-war women are an aspect of that history, which is 
quite unknown in the popular domain. There's not very much knowledge about anti-war women or the anti-war movement um, at all in Australia. There's academic work about it, but it hasn't reached out into the popular historical consciousness at all. So that's where I'm interested in it. Well, you said it's a departure from your previous work. Mm. So how did you come to this? Is it a, again, is it a personal or an activist or an intellectual question? What, what brought you to this? Well, it's a, it's a mix. It's um, personally, I'm uh, of an anti-war persuasion myself. Um, and uh, going right back to my early interest in history, I was really interested in Cold War history and um, all that kind of background to the armaments um, race. Uh, the work that I was doing on Indigenous history, though, came out of my personal family history and the discovery that my great-grandmother was an activist for Aboriginal rights. But she had a story that was quite interwoven with war history, um, World War I and World War II. Uh, and so this was sort of like a thread of her personal story that continued to interest and intrigue me um, because of the complexity of it. She was, she was right-wing, conservative, pro-war, um, but she was also um, quite critical of war. Um, and I, I have got a quote from her diary that um, sort of expresses the kind of outlook that she had, which I could... I well, could we, are in a, we are in an institution that is full of full archives of and archives, personal papers, yes. so, so let's hear from one. So well, you, so this is one of the us? things that sort of uh, stuck with me for a long time. She, she wrote a diary in 1918, at which time she'd just given... She had a year-old son. She married an AIF veteran. Um, so she was describing what it was like. I won't read the whole thing, but... Um, she was describing the feeling, and, and this is someone who's pro-war. It's the country with the men now who will come out on top, and so we send more men and more and more to the hungry inferno. They're all swallowed up, and again, we must muster the stragglers, the strays. In they come. We're not so particular now. Our finest and best have all gone, and almost anything on two legs will do to fill the ranks. And then she goes on about her heart aching. They're coming back, these men, what is left of them blind, maimed, limbless, from the housetops, politicians yell of what they will do for these splendid fellows. And so they come, but they are also still going. Surely the world is weary, they must stop soon. And, and then she talks about marrying her husband and having a child and living with her husband who was suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder, as we recognise now, a very common impact of World War I, uh, and trying to keep the baby quiet and saying it was becoming a torture to me. Each time I met friends or relatives, I was informed that I had started well and done my duty in having a son, but that I must keep up the good work as it was the duty of every woman to replenish the ranks of manhood again. I wondered why a son, a son, always a son. And that, uh, I found that very striking. And it informed her feminism in the interwar years, um, as well as her right-wing activities. So it's quite a complicated story. Well, it complicated, but it, it allows us back into everybody's work here, mm. I think, in, in the way that that original material does. Mm. And so as I listened to that, it actually made me think of your work, Nita, mm. because you do work on soldiers who are at the centre of a conventional war narrative, of course, but your work almost becomes an alternative history because you're tracking brutality, bad behaviour, moral responsibility. So is that then a story of soldiers or of the impact of war on civilians? I mean, what are you doing there? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a project that I just completed uh, called Accountability for Killing. And in it, I look at um, the inadvertent killing, uh, unintended killing of civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I wanted to try to understand who's morally responsible for that. Let's say when a bomb hits a village, uh, is it the person who dropped the bomb? Or if, if there's a stray bullet and uh, kills a civilian, or somebody's driving a truck down the road? And so the, the standard answer is it's the individual, because our standard understanding of 
moral responsibilities that individuals are responsible for their actions unless they uh, are somehow incapacitated. But what I found when I looked at um, the behavior of the soldiers is, is this sort of bad apple narrative or the sort of out of control soldier uh, narrative was missing uh, the kind of institutional context that the soldiers are in, that the rules of engagement that they have, uh, the standard operating procedures, and um, their training sort of made it more likely that they would um, kill somebody inadvertently, uh, not deliberately, and so that, or the, even the, the weapons that they had available to them. So then I began to look at organizational responsibility. And, and then sort of bring it out into an institutional context. So the story begins with understanding what happens on a battlefield, let's say when there's close air support, uh, a plane flies in to protect um, some people engaged in a hot situation, and then uh, p civilians are killed. So you have to go, go from the ground up and then find out sort of the chains of moral responsibility, moving further back in time uh, and, and, uh, and further back in the causal chain, how did the people get there and what did they have? Which I guess is where they tie back to the story of the young men in mm -hmm. the example from, from Victoria of, of what's happened to those men. Right, well, there's a culture that puts people there, yeah. And Karen, that's one of the things that you're interested in, isn't it? Addressing war as a story of violence and brutality which is another way into understanding this idea of anti-war. Yes, for me, um, every history of war has to, or it should be the center, violence should be really one of the core themes and centers of any history of war, because that is what stands for me in the center, the power to injure and the vulner vulnerability to injury. And of course, this is highly gendered, and actually this gender dimension is really what I'm mostly interested in. So in my own work, similar to yours, only uh, on a different period, mostly on the 19th century and also now on the 20th century, I look at the connections in discourses and practices of the military, of masculinity and military. And um, the question, one of the big questions for me and my research is really how can we, how did states and armies mobilize men to war? And what is really necessary for a society to uh, f fight a war? So with the changes of militaries, military structures, states, uh, really the kind of the question is really what is also necessary in a civil society? How is both rela related warfare and civil society? So given, given what Nita and Karen have said, Ben, I guess that's raising um, questions, of the moral questions of the ethics and morality of war. So I'm wondering, Fiona, as a historian, if you're looking at those questions and the impact on civilians and even on whole communities, how do you do that? Is it through the history of organisations and social movements for you? Is that a way to get into how a society confronts those moral and ethical questions of war? Well, I look mainly at uh, liberal progressive networks. So I am looking at particular kinds of international networks. And it's probably worth pausing and thinking about all of the international organizations outside of that frame. For example, um, the first Universal Racist Congress in 1911, which argued that um, you know, interracial, um, you know, it was inequality of the races that was fundamental, a fundamental cause of war and, and uh, conflict and violence in the world. So right from the early decades of the 20th century, I think a real interest in the causes of war is what we've been talking about. So organizations like the International um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, that we, we hear the peace and the freedom, but also these organizations were very concerned to educate themselves, inform themselves, educate the public into thinking about what the causes of war were and also trying to intervene, so militarization, uh, weapons, um, violence against women, inequality between the races and so on. So I think that is a really fascinating aspect of these organizations coming right the way through, that people are very challenged to work out what the causes were and therefore to be able to bring about their vision for a better future. 
in which conflict and interpersonal violences of various sorts would no longer um, be part of, of, of life, of, of human life. Um, and so to imagine a new kind of modern subject who would be essentially rational, um, who would understand about cultural difference, um, who would know how to, for example, at conferences come and not only share the latest information about social reform, but also um, how to do that, the process itself of meeting around a table. Um, and if you look again at that first Universal Racist Congress in 1911, that was also the idea of bringing all the peoples, the races and nations of the world around a table, this sort of um, wonderful idea that the connections between individuals would be taken away and would foster this new way, so catching on via individuals in this interpersonal way. Um, having said that, of course, um, the groups that I'm looking at are also very much embedded with imperial and colonial histories and often follow those same networks and con connections. Uh, so there are certain kinds of statements about um, humanitarianism and social justice that, of course, are based on notions of hierarchies of difference, particularly around race, often discussed in terms of culture. So while these um, people are really fascinating, I think, for these ideas and how much they connect with some of the very issues we're facing in our present, they're also very specific to their own historical context. So given that, and this is a question to all of you, which means whoever wants to answer it, leap in. Um, if what we're talking about then is how to create um, an anti-war history, um, is it then about necessarily tracing international connections and organisations, of, of which Fiona's just given us some examples, or do you do it in your own work in very specific and national ways? or even in terms of, you know, in individual people who take your, your interest. How do you... I'm, I'm thinking of how you actually do this other history, or even how each of you do it individually. I don't think that there is one answer. It really depends on our questions, the national and cultural context. So how does it work for you? For me, I'm working on different levels. You know, I did work where I looked at individuals and used autobiographical accounts especially if you're interested in the question of how people experienced violence and war, you know, civilians and soldiers in earlier periods, letters and autobiographies, memoirs are really important. But for me, that is not enough. I, we, as you did in your current, more current work, of course you need to place these individual experiences in their social, cultural and political context. So then it's important to understand, for example, the structures, the institutional structures of a military and how war was conducted and what was demanded institutionally, how the laws really played in. You know, and if you look at this with a gendered question, for example, at which point women were still allowed as camp followers, at which point they were excluded, which was really what did the military demand from civilian of kind of war support. And that brings you, you know, to the questions of mobilization, for example. And here you have to look at ideas, propaganda, visual material, you know, culture. And then, you know, if you go on the next level, of course, war is never something which is only national, even so the propaganda is very often nationalist, especially in time periods. This is a kind of, it's, it's absurd to say this, but it's a transnational, it's a border crossing experience. So, you know, in some ways, you know, if you then go to the level of negotiations and conflict and action, you really have to go to the international level. And so, I think we have to do it on all levels, but the questions which we ask and the methodologies we use are different and need to be appropriate to the different layers which we want to study. And uh, yeah, we have to put it in context every time. So if on the one hand then we've been talking very, very big grand mm -hmm. themes, I'm just going back to that phrase anti-war mm -hmm. as something that might mean not war or not our conventional notions of it. And so I wonder, Victoria, if mm. an anti-war history might just also include those stories that don't fit the mainstream model of war yeah. and being outside its boundaries. And 
One great example of that is something I read of your work, where you found a cross-dressing young woman who tried to go to World War I. Now, is her story an anti-war story? Because it doesn't fit. Yeah, her story is a very subversive story. So in that way, it sort of um, contests the romanticisation that we have Can of war in Australia. Um, this is Maud Butler, who um, sort of caught my heart for some reason. Um, I'm very um, superstitious about the way I write history. I, I, w I like the stories to come to me, and then I feel like, well, they want me to, they want me to follow them, so I will. Um, and Maud, Maud has come to me for some reason, a coal miner's daughter who uh, was raised by a single father um, and left the family home at the age of 14 and went down to become a waitress in Sydney and uh, snuck onto a um, troop ship going off to Egypt and was discovered uh, a day or so out to sea brought back and so she dressed as a, she dressed as a, a soldier to get onto the ship. They brought her back, they were very um, kind of nice to her, sent her back home. Then they caught her again. Uh, that was, so this first, the first incident was around Christmas 1915. They caught her again in March 1916. This time she had a revolver. She also had a forged identity disc. Um, and uh, she'd made a lot more effort. She had um, pretended to be drunk to get on the ship without being noticed because uh, that was probably the best way of impersonating a soldier in those days. <laughs> um, and so they were, weren't so happy about this at all. Um, but again, she was sort of left, left off with a rebuke. And then she got in quite a lot of trouble on the very first um, Anzac Day. Uh, in 1916, she was arrested again for impersonating a soldier. And this time it turned out that the uh, Returned Soldiers League had actually put her up to it um, to dress as a soldier to go around and collect money for um, the Anzacs. And so the judge was uh, kind of thought it was um, really a bit unfair on her that she'd been uh, hauled into court again. Um, but actually gave her a criminal conviction this time because it, w it was becoming a bit of a concern. And her, what her story illuminates is a whole lot of different aspects about war. Um, for instance, there was a black market going on in the sale of soldiers' uniforms. Um, there was also a problem with uh, men, mostly, not women, impersonating AIF. Uh, veterans to raise money for themselves. Uh, and there's a whole issue about drunkenness and soldiers that she's touching on. So what she kind of did was she undermined the mythology at the very time it was being formed. And she did so in a way where she was very innocently saying, but I just want to be part of this myth. I want to be part of this um, great drama. So it was very difficult for them to deal with her. So, so it's an interesting example. Mm. I mean, and you might question whether that's an anti-war story, but it's mm. a not quite the war story. No, it's not quite war. What <laughs> is the war story in your mind? Well, yes. Mm. Um, and, and because I am recording this for radio, I'm going to do a few little radio things that you might think are a bit peculiar, <laughs> which will include editing out that comment. <laughs> <laughs> on Big Ideas on RN, and at the State Library of Queensland, I'm Kate Evans in conversation with Fiona Paisley, Nita Crawford, Karen Hageman, and Victoria Haskins. If, again, if what we're talking about here is a, a different model for history, it it's, can be, of course, a messy and difficult one. And so what I'd like to ask you all about is the uncomfortable aspects of your work. And Nita, I've read, I mean, I've, I've read your recent work on the ethics and morality of war. And it's powerful and it's difficult. Um, and I wondered what's the most difficult part for you of reading and analysing this work? Is it having to confront the detail of, and this is a phrase you take apart comprehensively in your book, confronting the whole concept of collateral damage? Mm -hmm. 
There's so much about my work that is difficult. I don't know where to begin. I, I, again, I've been doing this a long time, so. Uh, well, maybe could you just explain what yeah. you're doing yeah. with, with taking apart that idea? Okay. Well, I'll just talk about something I'm working on recently in, in, as an illustration. Um, I've been, uh, after this whole book on uh, collateral damage, I asked myself the question, has the United States always uh, taken care with civilians? And because I've, I found in this work that the US was taking greater care, and the, the whole sort of narrative was taking great care to protect civilians. And then I, I um, did a lot of research to ask the questions, uh, how does, has the United States military treated civilians from the colonial era to the present? And I found out uh, through this research that the US has uh, targeted civilians for one of two things, either the thumb screws, you know, uh, make their life difficult, uh, kill civilians, um, or hearts and minds consistently. And so what's uh, very difficult for me in this, in this many years I've been working on, these, on, on this subject is that there's a lot of sameness to the story, right? So uh, the common way in the, the Middle Ages of uh, attacking civilians was to burn their homes and their food stores. Turns out that's the way the US colonial military, uh, uh, the, the English, before them, and then the, uh, the, the US military in the late 18th century and through the 19th century behaved. And then as we know, they burned uh, large swaths of Germany and Japan. So fire is consistent, and sort of understanding sort of the method of war is consistent. Uh, that's difficult, I think. But, but what actually gives me heart through this whole, um, you know, why do I keep at this, right, is I, I have a lot of uh, sense that uh, every era uh, there are these activists who are gradually doing uh, two things, denormalizing war, denaturalizing it, delegitimizing it, and then offering an alternative. And essentially their alternatives gradually get institutionalized. Right. And um, so they, they, you see that certain forms of warfare are delegitimized. The way that slavery was delegitimized, certain weapons are delegitimized. Think of uh, the recent ban on landmines or chemical weapons. And that all along, there's, there's two narratives. There's war and there's anti-war. And what you see, uh, and you mentioned this a bit, is that in the anti-war narrative, it's often institutions, organizations that are doing multiple things. They're working on anti-slavery and they're working on anti-colonialism and they're working on anti-war. And the individuals and their families, like your family, Karen, um, that, that it goes through generations. Uh, the Buxtons were anti-war in, in England. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, anti-slavery in England and they became anti-colonial uh, through generations. And so that's what, that's what keeps me going is that this constant sort of dialectic so I was actually going to ask you all what was the most difficult and what mm -hmm. was the, the hardest thing to, what was the least comfortable part of your work. But perhaps having heard what Mita just said, I should rather ask what gives you, what gives you hope from a, and in a historical perspective, Karen? That there was, even in 20th century Europe, continuously a movement also against war, a movement for social justice, a movement for more freedom and for liberty. And that's something which tends to be forgotten, especially in respect of the German history. The picture outside of Germany is very much, you know, focusing on militarism and nationalism and the Holocaust. But from my own family perspective and from my own scholarship, and I started to work on labor movements and women's movements, there was every time a movement against this. And in some ways, the very conservative militaristic response was a response against this movement. So it's a dialectic thing. And so I'm really believing that we have to tell both stories. We have to understand what causes war, what costs what, what war costs us, which consequences war has, what enables people to fight in a critical approach, but we also need to analyze the counter-movements and the tradition of these counter-movements, because otherwise we leave 
I leave my students and I leave the next generation, and we all are mo mothers here, yeah? We really leave this next generation without a message of hope. You know, it's, so it's both for me, and that's why I really also believe in the combination of scholarship and activism. You know, I was very active in the peace movement myself, too. And it's in some ways I'm proud of this tradition nowadays. I'm, at the, when I was younger, I was hiding it, but now, no. <laughs> yeah, you don't really, I'm not really, you know, you have these conflicts with your parents, but, <laughs> but now I'm really, yeah, I think we need both, very much so. Well, then, in creating these, these powerful stories, one of the things that media and popular versions look for, then, is for personal stories. And conventional war histories are very keen on heroes. Mm -hmm. So, Fiona Paisley, do you want to find, or have you found, heroes in the anti-war movements that you've looked at? Is that a useful way of thinking about them? Uh, well, heroes, it's a, yeah, it's a difficult term. It's an odd term, mm. isn't it? And um, I would say definitely not. Um, I, haven't found, I haven't been looking for heroes, but um, I think you do need to really respect um, the efforts of the people that you're looking at who are involved and are actually active uh, and doing things, however much you can critique them for their position as well. So, I mean, I think it's a fine line between celebrating what has been achieved and also being critical and... Here I'm looking, I'm thinking again about my, my networks that I'm looking at. And I was actually, as you were working down the line, preparing my answer to your previous question. <laughs> so I'll kind of roll it into one and say that, um, contradictorily, um, I find a lot of hope in the ways that we can be critical about these individuals. And um, that rather than creating a notion of idealists, who are somehow over there with their idealistic ideas, but they're not practical and they're not realistic. And that, um, you know, like um, into the interwar years, the, there were years of great idealism, but of course they failed to look at the world politics and realise that another world war was coming along. So if you actually ditch that whole narrative, you get something I think much more interesting, but more complex and problematic. And I'll give you an example of an Australian woman who went to the Institute of Pacific Relations in 1925. She'd been working in the Young Women's Christian Association. She uh, believed in social um, reform. She was a progressive. And she'd been living in London um, during World War I and had experienced the trauma of that in her young life. Uh, so she went off to Hawaii for this conference um, implicitly, of course, not an anti-war network necessarily, but a network that saw um, social reform as a way of ending warfare and violence. But she took with her a notion of um, the positive impact of, of immigration restriction in Australia. So the difficult aspect of this, of course, is that you need to see both sides of her political position. She goes to Hawaii. She wants to talk to Japanese delegates coming to the conference because she wants to find out what they think about a white Australian immigration restriction. And the Japanese delegates who were um, you know, leading um, peace pacifists at this time in these um, international networks in the Pacific um, ex expressed their concern that these were racist views, um, that they discriminated and that they were um, uh, completely unfair because Australia had all this land that it could accept more population into. And her argument was that, well, the one thing they left out was a question of assimilability, that was her great word, which meant that some cultures just won't mix. So her idea of a peaceful future was a world where you would understand that, that there were limits that certain people wouldn't be able to live together. So that to me is, in a way, the hope I find is that we can think about people in this complex range of ideas and we have to take, if you like, the good with the bad. May I at some point... No. <laughs> Kate, can I, can I add some point to the hero? Yes. Because I really don't think that this is the right approach. We don't need heroes. 
We don't need people on the pedestal, which we aim for. We need normal people with good and bad, with ambiguities, with paradoxes, who fought in these movements. Because if, you know, if we have these heroes like in the resistance against the uh, Third Reich, nobody can really reach them. So that is not really what gives me hope. Yeah, it, it gives me hope that very ordinary people who had all the problems we all have really were able to do something and make a difference. And they failed. And sometimes they were defeated. And then they were again defeated. But that is part of a movement. And I think that is the narrative we need with all these ambiguities which, which Fiona was talking about. Sorry, I'm still just having quite <laughs> <laughs> I tried to go. <laughs> no, the trouble with heroes is that it's, they're always going to disappoint you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yep. you know, you really have to understand um, people in their complexity. And, and organisations also are not heroic. Mm -hmm. um, they, have, they have terrible splits and antagonisms, and, and you can see the, the things they do to each other are not, uh, are not um, very noble. But uh, the... What's, what is um, inspiring is that people do keep trying uh, and that, that impulse is there continually. And, and they, keep, they keep trying for generations, mm. right? So I, I think of um, the anti-slavery movement in the United States in the 19th century. Um, these people, Lydia Maria Child, Emerson, um, others who are famous, and the many other people in these anti slavery movements, after uh, abolition is achieved, they move on to trying to end the wars against Native people. Um, so then they, they use some of the same techniques of, of gathering people, Native people, let's say uh, a chief or a delegation and bring them to New York City and they'll speak at Cooper Union or they'll go to Boston and they'll <laughs> speak in the same facilities that uh, uh, Frederick Douglass spoke in and then bring alive to the average person on the East Coast what was happening in the West Coast, which was decimation. And so, to, and they sort of continued their activism um, and, and then passed it on to the next generation. So, excuse me. <coughs> so really, <clears throat> I was just being playful in, <clears throat> <clears throat> in throwing out the idea of heroes to try to imagine what a popular mm -hmm. um, history, anti-war history might look like, mm -hmm. given the strength that conventional war histories have had on popular culture. So what you've given us, I mean, you've shown us how complex and layered that history is, but also that it is something that is already happening. And, and I imagine there are people in the room who are doing it as well. And so I wonder if you have any uh, questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have some... Um, microphones as well. <coughs> Any questions or comments? And we have one in the middle. <coughs> My apologies. Yes, I, I'm very struck by how, um, how, how the anti-war movement is so much at war with the inner nature of humans because it's so, much, so natural to us to feel boundary-driven antagonisms, that just a natural part of every life form. Uh, I'm, I'm not anti-anti-war, and I'm not particularly pro-war. Um, there, there are some individuals I do dislike intensely. Um, but I, I, I'm just wondering, uh, well, it's very obvious, the psychodynamic perspective all uh, examined by any of the five of you. I think Nita has, actually. I'll, yes, I well, I, I don't hear any uh, words about it, and I think that's the interesting part, because that's what makes it happen. The fact that we all innately hate particular individuals, <coughs> and we need to look at why we hate them. And while we're all sitting here thinking we're nice people and we're activists in the peace movement, we're never going to get anywhere. So I'd just like to hear what you've all got to say about that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Right, so um, there are a couple layers of answers to that. The first is that I, 
at sort of an archaeological and anthropological level, uh, humans have been cooperating more often than not for thousands of years. 9,000 years we've got evidence of, of cooperation. You think of uh, uh, Hobbes telling the story of life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. And that's sort of the narrative you just gave of, uh, you know, people are aggressive. And, and um, actually, no, there's a lot more evidence archaeologically and anthropologically of cooperation. And there are peaceful cultures that's, that made it to the 20th century, 21st century as well. I can name them, Kung, um, uh, others. Uh, as, uh, but that's one layer. So the history is varied, okay? There are ethnocentric cultures and there are sort of opposite of that uh, cultures, uh, not ethnocentric. Um, okay, the, another layer is uh, on this, at the biological level. And um, human nature is also varied in the sense that um, uh, we have uh, empathy, which develops quite early in individuals and allows us to um, share, cooperate, um, to understand the impact of our actions, right? And, and then the, the heroic stories of rescuers in World War II are stories of this, this natural empathy being mobilized. And there's some really interesting work um, being done on that. And, and that on another level, you see, uh, uh, sort of the social political level, you see institutions of cooperation all over. So we have both. It's not that humans uh, are, are this um, sort of nasty, uh, brutish um, uh, animal that you've described, but we have both. I would argue that we have, uh, that we have evidence for both and that um, they've, they've worked side by side. And what dominates actually is the cooperative. And another uh, piece of evidence is that if you may not know this, and everybody who hears it always scratches their head and says, this can't be true, it's that, that we have had less war mm -hmm. over the last 150 years. That warfare is actually diminishing the incidence of war is, is declining, okay, since the mid-19th century, right? So humans are getting more peaceful, oddly. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to say on this. I could but another on. part of that question was about looking at violence and the history of violence and almost industrialised killing, and it seems to me that that is something, Karen, that is part of your work. Yes, and actually even there, it's very interesting. You might think that it's easy to, of the military leadership to make men to kill. It's not. You need a lot of discipline and drilling, and it's not by accident that all militaries really recruit their soldiers in a very young age when they can mold and form them. And actually, even in war itself, only one third of the soldiers in the front line is shooting. So you might, you know, when we think about war, it's this idea that everybody is involved in combat and everybody is shooting. It's not. It's really, really hard to make humankind kill. It's not that this is something which we really want. Of course, there is also the other side. We know about, we know the, because of our research that there are some who really enjoy killing who enjoy war, the adventure of killing. So it's both, I don't want to point the only positive picture, but it's really, really difficult. And you know, the survival in war of soldiers is really mostly then based off also very human values. It's comradeship, it's taking care of the brother, you know, it's, so it's really, it's not so easy as, you know, we politicians tell us, and the media tell us, and that is the second aspect, which is very clear. It is a question of the culture of violence, the culture of war. So if our culture is really em embracing violence, is creating a relatively positive picture, if there is an image of masculinity, which is very virile, which is appreciating violence, brutality, power, that is something which is really very important. That's why it, all war powers and all states needed enormous amounts of propaganda if they wanted to make people fight. 
Yeah? And so if you look at all the propaganda before every war, it's amazing how much emphasis is put into this, even nowadays, if you look at the media. So I really think it's, you know, in addition to what you said, it's, it's not as easy as it seems to be. I might just actually see if there are any other, other questions. And we'll, do, we'll just do a, a few very quickly because we're going to run out of time. So, and I, because I can't, I'm being slightly blinded by that light. So I can see somebody there and somebody here and I can see you down front as well, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd just like a, a, a quick comment about um, how history and anti-war um, may um, inform or how um, post-traumatic stress and um, the increasing amount of suicide um, that we're, we're seeing with our, in, with our returned soldiers. What, what's that dialogue looking like and, and how we can be learning from that? I think that probably again speaks most to Nita's work. Right, so the, the, uh, in, in some months more soldiers commit suicide than die in, uh, on a battlefield in the war zone. Um, and then veterans also have high rates of suicide. You all know this, right? So why is that? And why, despite you know the tremendous amount of resources that have been put into psychological care, are they still uh, attempting to kill themselves and, and, and often succeeding? It's uh, repeated deployments. It's the cumulative stress. And the United States recently uh, has been at war now. What was it? Were you year 14? You know, moving into year 14. Uh, we're on year 13, um, multiple deployments, um, one, two, three, four, many months, and the tempo, is the, that's the technical term, is high, and there's little downtime in between, and there's a lot of stress in the family. Um, and there's, there's still this sort of macho attitude, people are malingering if they say they have PTSD, um, they're faking it, uh, they just want benefits. And so um, even though uh, the, the United States military, for example, has put a lot of resources into it, it's finding it very difficult um, to, to cut into that problem. And we might just have time for the two questions. So there's the man in white and the man down the front. And sorry, and this man here, yep. Yes, I, I like the answer to that too. Um, one of the things that causes us to have wars is that a great deal of preparation goes into war and, you know, it takes about a decade at least to prepare to have a war, like the Indochina War, for example. That had its beginnings back in the late 40s and the early 1950s. Um, so logistics and building up supplies of enough ammunition and so forth and the fact that that is an industry that creates jobs and helps to keep politicians in power. Could you talk to that please? Would oh, you I'll just sponsor? come in quickly on that, just with the Australian situation with World War I. The, the militarism began um, in Australia at, at around the turn of the century. So Australia was introducing compulsory military training for youths, um, was having the British come and visit Australia to talk about fleets, and there was a whole lot of movement about getting ready for war without any idea of who the war was going to be with. Um, but there, there was that kind of process going on. And uh, the, some of the early anti-war activists came out to Australia before war was declared because of what was going on with the military training being brought in and seeing this, it was important to, to be protesting before a war was declared. So I think that's an important message that anti-war movements uh, because war takes time, anti-war activism needs to begin before the war begins, well, well before. But the other thing that that um, recognises that we unfortunately haven't really had time to get to is the way in which if we're thinking about an anti-war history, it's both the build-up and then really importantly the aftermath 
of a war becomes almost a whole anti-war space because it's not the war, but it has been so affected by it. And again, I know that you've all done work on aftermath and return, which I think is a really interesting area in, in cultural history that's getting more and more attention. Um, but there is just, I'm sorry, this, the, the man in the cream jumper has been waiting. <laughs> and, um, and unfortunately, that will have to be our last question. My apologies. Uh, I just want to start, you, you raise the issue about stories and heroes and things like that. And I think that's a very good point because to get the, um, I think the history of anti-war needs to come back to individuals a lot. And um, my, my grandfather and my grandmother were anti-war people in the First World War. And uh, they, they made quite a profound statement at that time by actually standing up and walking out of the church because the church was a supporter of, of conscription at the time and they never went back. And, um, and, and that was a, profoundly affected their lives and their children, my father and his brothers, after that because they had to make certain adjustments because the church was such an important part of the uh, role in the community. I'd just like you to comment on, on that particular aspect as how institutions do actually determine a lot about you know, what we actually do and how people behave. And when you go against those institutions, how that can have such a profound effect on, on those individuals. And we don't hear a lot about those sorts of stories. Is that something that ties in with your work, Fiona? Oh, yes. I mean, I think it's uh, right down to the individual level. These small moments are um, very profound. Um, how to actually bring them into histories and um, have them circulate further is, I think, a really, really important question. And obviously, a library like this that gathers those kinds of stories and makes them accessible to others as well. So a wonderful to have that in your own family history going forward. And certainly seeing um, individuals that I've, you know, I've, I've been following their careers as a historian and, um, you know, to see them being thrown out of an, uh, an organisation or a network they're in. I'm thinking of someone like Eleanor Moore, who was, again, in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, who was thrown out of, I think, the National Council of Women for opposing uh, conscription. So, yes, these small acts are um, of bravery, I guess we'd say. Other people want to comment? And would the rest of you like to, to comment before like we... I to comment, up? combine both questions in one, because uh, I think we have to see it together. You know, if we think about war and the causes of war, we need to understand it's all about power and money and resources. You know, and that, you know, the, that's what causes war, but that also is necessary for war. And that includes on the level of groups and people, of course, you know, the preparation of war includes institutions. And the churches don't have a very good role to play. Not all of them, of course, they are Quakers and, you know, traditions in, 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 in different religions which are quite peaceful. But if we think about Europe and the role of the European churches, you know, they were big supporters of the war and, you know, and had a play, big role to play. And so your story is not unheard of. There are several stories of this. And I think we need to uh, really see, you know, these connections here. And, uh, yeah, you know, as you said, if you look at the big picture of the First World War, all nations, and new scholarship, for example, by Christopher Clark is really showing this, all nations prepared in a very similar or powerful nations, prepared for war and were ready to start it and do it. You know, and in some ways it was this accidental killing, you know, of the uh, Ferdinand, uh, who really was the spark who started it. It could have been something different. And I guess the other thing that we haven't had a chance to, to um, refer to, um, and that is the whole costs of war. And Nita, you're involved in a project called the Costs of War. Can you just briefly explain what that is for us as we as we finish? In um, the United States, we were told that uh, the Iraq War would be, you know, I don't know, 25 billion, 30 billion. Um, we weren't given an estimate for the costs of what it would take to to reform. Um, Afghanistan. So the, the people who were engaged in the Cost of War project 
wanted to look at what the war actually cost in dollars, but also to broaden the conversation to understand what the human toll was. So the Cost of War Project is a group of about 30 academics. I'm the co-director of it with Catherine Lutz, uh, which has uh, used anthropologists, economists, um, uh, sociologists, medical doctors to understand the, the toll in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan of the U.S. wars there. And so we've done uh, sort of good old forensic accounting. The Department of Defense uh, is a very opaque institution in terms of its books. Uh, but we've figured out essentially what the, the costs of the war are, not just the budget costs, but the over base uh, costs. And then we were also trying to understand the human toll in terms of uh, not just people killed uh, directly by the violence, which is about 300,000 in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan, though those estimates are, are, are just that, because we don't know exactly, but also the indirect death that comes fr from when uh, infrastructure is destroyed or damaged or people are, are made refugees. And what we've been trying to do is sort of broaden the understanding, not just what happens to U.S. soldiers, which is, a, of course, of great interest to Americans, but to everybody. And then what the long-term costs are, the long-term economic costs. For example, the United States borrowed to pay for these wars. We didn't tax. Okay, so that means that already the United States has paid $316 billion in interests on the borrowing, and we'll pay $7 trillion in interest alone on a war that is so far cost $4.4 trillion. So add $4.4 to seven, and you get a, a very big number, <laughs> right? It's, it's hard to imagine. And so the Cost of War Project is trying to make it clear to people that uh, wars don't end when they end, uh, that the wars cost, uh, they keep hurting in, in human and economic terms. And then to go to your, your point about, uh, you know, militarism and the military and armaments create jobs. Well, it turns out, unfortunately, um, that you can get a lot more jobs if you spend the same amount, the same billions or millions uh, in uh, solar energy, uh, in housing, in uh, uh, education, in medicine, in construction. All of these fields create more jobs uh, per million dollars spent. But it's not as profitable for the lobbies. But that's a very powerful point to end on. So I should say, I'm Kate Evans. This is Big Ideas on RN. And we've been reimagining the 20th century as an anti-war century with Professor Karen Hageman from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Professor Nita Crawford of Boston University and co-director of costsofwar.org, Professor Fiona Paisley of Griffith University and Associate Professor Victoria Haskins at the University of Newcastle. Please do thank them all. And before you go, I'd like to add one other thing. Um, this evening in Sydney, there's um, an announcement of the Susan McGarry Biography Award, which is sponsored by the Australian Historical Association and the Australian Association for the Study of Australian Literature. And in fact, it's being awarded to Fiona Paisley, who's sitting right here. <laughs> And in case you haven't read it, that is for her rather wonderful book, The Lone Protester, A.M. Fernando in Australia and Europe, which is published by Aboriginal Studies Press. So go out and buy that and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>